σας κυρίες και κύριοι, βρισκόμαστε στο Βίτερς Hall, όπου το εμπορικό τμήμα της ΥΠΑ της Κυπριακής Αρμοστίας διοργανώνει εκδήλωση με όνομα Wine Testing και Masterclass. Εδώ δείχνουν την παρουσία τους πολλά εινοποιεία της Κύπρου με τα ποιοτικά κρασιά τους, τα το οποία έχουν ως στόχο να επενδύσουν στην αγορά της Μεγάλης Βρετανίας. Το Hellenic TV βρίσκεται εδώ πέρα για να καταγράψει το Wine Testing και Masterclass. Ας το παρακολουθήσουμε.
apparently the traffic's really horrible, so they wanted me to wait just a few minutes to see if anybody else was going to come, come along. But in theory, this class is fully booked, um, and obviously not everybody's made it, but uh, still, for me, it's always, it's great to see people interested in Cyprus, because I've been going to Cyprus and following Cyprus wines for about 15 years now. And some of you will know that my, my main specialist interest is Eastern Europe. So Cyprus kind of, you might think, how does that fit in with my particular interest in the former communist bloc? Um, <clears throat> so when I see in Cyprus both some parallels and differences, but the parallels come in that Cyprus was a had a wine industry that relied very, very heavily on large quantities of wine-flavoured alcoholic beverage at one time. You know, if you go back to, um, you know, the 70s, the 80s, when I started in the wine trade, the amount of sort of Cyprus sherry-style wine that I used to buy for Augustus Barnett, remember them? Um, you know, there were vast quantities of... Um, <clears throat> and dominated by four very, very big wineries. So again, sort of parallels with the way that wine was produced um, in Eastern Europe, in the planned economy, in vast wineries where quality did not matter. So one of the sort of changes, particularly around the time of joining the EU, but it kind of kicked off a bit earlier than that with the loss of some of the large Soviet markets and so on was that Cyprus has reinvented itself. Um, and it's reinvented itself to an industry today where we've got a huge number, I mean, not a massive number, but quite a significant number of small private wineries who are really focused on quality. And, um, and what I find very interesting about Cyprus particularly is that the new generation of wineries who are really developing quality are all people that actually make a living from wine. And if you go and look at other places, particularly in Eastern Europe, a lot of the new generation wineries are still kind of hobby wineries or they're status symbol wineries and they're not committed to it in the same way that these guys are actually making a living from wine and are really rooted into it. Um, so, so there's definitely a difference there uh, in terms of, you know, I mean, it's exciting to see the development of these small wineries because they're the ones that push quality forward or lead the drive for pushing quality forward. But say, so I think in Cyprus, you have this extra dimension of a new generation of wine producers who really live from it. Um, and what's good to see is that they're doing well from it because consumers are responding. Consumers are interested in quality Cypress wines as well. So hopefully you will leave this tasting and uh, the taste, all the wines downstairs inspired about the quality of Cypress wines. Because if you haven't tasted Cyprus wines recently, they have evolved so much in the last few years. So let me uh, try and make the technology work. <coughs> right. OK, so, so that's me. That's some of the places I write. Um, but more importantly, this is the island of Cyprus. Um, so. The wines we're looking at today are from the Greek part of Cyprus. Um, I haven't ventured any further over the border, really. So, um, and divided, particularly, the most important wine regions are the Paphos region to, to the west of the country, the Lemosos or Limassol region, and then just a few produce, well, just one, really, over in Larnaca, and the odd ones close to the border of Lefkosia, where the capital, or Nicosia, as some people might know it better. So there are, uh, in fact, five PDOs for Cyprus wine. Um, 
but mostly not in use. But interesting to see that, that they are coming into use gradually. Um, and then, but most of the wines would be regional wines, so PGI, Paphos, or Lemus, uh, Lim Lemosos, or Larnaca. So, um, the geography of Cyprus is important, though. Obviously, it's an island, so you have a maritime influence at the coast, but it's a long way south and southeast. It's only about an hour flight. You can go on a day trip to Egypt from Cyprus. So that tells you actually how close to Africa we actually are. So pretty warm climate. And one of the reasons why it's such a popular tourist destination, I think, especially um, for me, not in the height of the summer, but, you know, it has an attractive climate for sun, sea and sand, which is what many people go to Cyprus for. But there's a lot more to Cyprus than that. And one is, that makes it particularly interesting from a wine point of view is the Trudos Mountains in the centre of the island, which is actually part of the reason why high quality viticulture and high quality wine making is possible here, even in spite of the summer heat, because it can very easily be over 40 degrees on the coast in the summer, which in the old days of the big wineries who were based at the coast, kind of wasn't great for wine quality. So what's happened over the last few years is many people have moved their operations from the coast and got rid of, their coastal sites have been quite valuable to sell off for tourism and you can use that then to invest in vineyards and wineries up in the mountains where you have the benefits of cool air, particularly at night time. So altitude has been really, really important for Cyprus wines. Um, and it's nice to have this tasting here in Five Kings House because they're still very proud, and I don't know if you've seen the sign downstairs over the door as you come in, they're very proud of having got five kings to come to dinner here back in 1363. Um, I think that's quite an achievement, and one of those kings was King Peter of Cyprus. Um, and the vintners still have five cheers in their toast to recognise the fact that they're proud of getting a whole five kings in one place for a banquet here. So just a little bit of history and a reason why it's so good to have a Wines of Cyprus tasting here because, you know, those close connections. Um, so a little bit of statistics. I'm sorry, you might not be able to read these very clearly at the back, but if anybody wants these numbers, we can arrange for you to have a copy of them. But important to see, you know, the key grape varieties that are grown on Cyprus. And I dug out some statistics I had from 2006, just as a comparison, to show some of the changes that have happened. So one of the things that has changed is the vineyard area, even in the last 10 years or so, has dropped from 11,624 11, hectares in 2006 to 7,873 hectares now. So quite a lot of vineyard area has gone. But a lot of that vineyard area, one, one hopes, has been the lower quality uh, sites. Um, one of the great varieties that has particularly lost vineyard area is Mavro, which has gone from 5,600 hectares down to just over 3,000. Um, and we'll talk about Mavro in a minute. Zinisteri, though, which is the second most important grape variety, again, we're going to have a look at. It's interesting to see its vineyard area has stayed fairly stable, um, probably because and when we get onto the wine, I'll talk about its quality potential. Um, but this is a real strength for Cyprus, that it has a good area of a unique local grape variety that can be a statement for the island. So that's important to see. OK, Sultanina, Sultana, um, basically it's for raisins and grapes, not very much wine made from it. Um, interesting to see, for me, that Shiraz has has increased its plantings, whereas Cabernet Sauvignon has decreased. Carignan Noir has decreased a lot. Maratheftico, um, so if you're interested in the red grape varieties, you have to come back and listen to Dimitri, or you have to go downstairs and taste with the 
you know, the winemakers downstairs. Um, so Marithefdico, you know, probably the signature red grape variety for Cyprus, um, and that has increased its area a bit. It's a bit difficult to grow. It needs a cross-pollinator and, and so on, so a bit challenging. And then, you know, you've got a mixture of international grape varieties and then coming down to one or two more local ones. Um, but what's fascinating for me and what I'm trying to focus on today is some of these local grape varieties that have been pretty much forgotten. Um, and one of the great things that Cyprus has in its favour is it has never had phylloxera. Um, and it has very strict quarantine regulations in place um, in terms of controlling the plant material that comes into Cyprus which sometimes is a bit of a pain for the winemakers, particularly if they want to experiment with, you know, getting some of their old grape varieties multiplied up outside Cyprus, for instance, getting the material back into Cyprus again. It can be challenging, or if they want to work with root stocks again, those restrictions can be a problem. But on the other hand, the fact that they've never had Cyprus means that there are genuinely very old vines in Cyprus. Let's, oh, a few more statistics. So here you can, I put this one up so that you can see some of these old grape varieties that are starting to re reappear. So hecto kilo, so this will be hundreds of kilograms. So lots and lots of Mavro and Zinisteri. Um, but then you can start to see some of the production of Yanudi and Moroccanella and Sportico and Primara, which are some of the grapes I'm showing. They are appearing on the statistics, but, and they are growing, but they're still not big production. Um, and, okay, I wanted to show you this one because one of the issues that Cyprus has is its balance of trade of local grape varieties versus imports. So there are still an awful lot of imports coming into Cyprus and relatively small exports. So, um, do I have that? And then this is the total production in 2017. So you can see the volume of imported wine is actually kind of not far off the amount of wine they're producing on Cyprus. So maybe six, you know, 55, 45, but that volume of imported wines has been a problem for Cyprus wine producers for a long time and continues to be so because, particularly nowadays, of all-inclusive holiday packages. Because all-inclusive packages means that the hotels want to offer the cheapest possible wine that they can, they can. And cost of production on Cyprus is not cheap because of the mountains that I was mentioning. Um, and because, you know, and it comes down to, I suppose, a cultural thing and an educational thing and encouraging the food and beverage managers in these hotels and restaurants that... Actually, there's value to add if they can sell Cyprus wines and good quality Cyprus wines rather than just buckets and buckets of whatever cheap stuff they can buy from Spain or Italy or the New World because they're selling that, you know, it's, it's part of people's package. So, you know, that is a challenge and an opportunity and a threat to the new generation of Cyprus wine producers. Um, so, and in terms of categories, I said that there are the, uh, the five PDOs and the PGIs. So you can see still PDO wines are relatively small and mostly Commanderia, but there are a few other categories of wines also. There's a Vasilicon have now made their Zinisteri into a PDO Zinisteri because of where it comes from. So it's nice to see people thinking about expressing their specific place, um, again, which is, a, I think, a sign of progress in the wine industry. But still quite a lot of just table wines being produced, red and white particularly. Um, other wines, I think, include sparklings. 
Um, but anyway, that's just a rough overview of the numbers, which are boring but important. So very long history in winemaking, as a lot of this, this area in um, southeastern Europe you know, probably the great Vitis Silvestris was first tamed in the Caucasus, but it very quickly travelled around the Black Sea um, into uh, southeastern Europe. And there is some evidence that there were maybe secondary domestication events in this area as well. So very long evidence of winemaking, so clay jars and things with traces of wine in them. Oldest name wine in co uh, continuous production in Commanderia um, and still being made today. So we're going to have a look at a couple of those. But say this new focus on quality is what I find really exciting. Okay, lack of phylloxera. So quarantine, possibly also the fact the mountain altitude and the very heavily limestone based uh, soils may have a, may be a reason why phylloxera has never established. But either way, it's never been there. Some of the highest altitude vineyards in Europe, I mean, we're talking 1,500 metres for, many, uh, for some of the highest, which is, you know, it's a long way up. I mean, OK, so the Argentinians go higher, but talking Europe here. Um, so it's... A, and because of that, you know, the winemakers in Cyprus really never get a rest because they have to start picking some of the low vineyards and the early ripening grape varieties in July. And then some of the guys, like uh, Minas Mina was telling me that he's still picking his Zinisteri in November. So, you know, most winemakers can pick their crop in a month to six weeks, but not the poor guys in Cyprus. No sleep for months on end. Um, and it's great to see, and I think you'll see downstairs, that there is a new generation of, the, of young people and young thinking people coming into Cyprus wine. Um, and because Cyprus is a small island, most young people go abroad to uh, go to university. So they actually come back very open-minded and well-educated, usually multilingual, as well as having studied winemaking or chemistry or food technology or all sorts of things. So very dynamic group of young people. And again, if you compare that to Western Europe, where a lot of wine people are getting older, their kids are not interested because that was their parents' generation wine. You know, young people are interested in wine in Cyprus. I also see this in Romania, in Bulgaria and in Hungary, that young people, both on the wine producing side of things and the wine drinking side of things are really interested in wine. So that's, that's great to have this dynamism and to have these open-minded people who are prepared to travel and talk and taste other people's wines and come back with ideas to, to, to inspire them at home. Um, and I mentioned this about many of these young people, uh, a new generation winemakers, are living from wine. So... You know, this point about no phylloxera is really important because it means that you have vines in the vineyards that are genuinely old. I mean, you know, you can see from the picture these are, you know, dozens, possibly in some cases, they reckon some of the vineyards may, uh, you know, maybe on routes that are several hundred years old because they haven't had to go to this, you know, model of buying grafted vines. You could just root a cutting and just keep going. So, and because of that, some of these old varieties are still in these vineyards to be rediscovered. Some of these varieties that existed, you know, pre-Ottoman and so on. So, you know, properly venerable ancient grape varieties and you don't see vines like, you know, an old vine in France is 30 years old. I mean, these these guys are serious pensioners. And of course, being this old, they're naturally producing low yields, which, you know, great for quality, right? Um, so we're going to start then with one of these old revived grape varieties at a winery called Vunipanaya, which was the first private winery 
in, founded in 1987. So that's how recent the new generation of private wineries is, by a chap called Andreas Kyriakides, who was a former uh, researcher at the Viticultural Institute. Um, and now he has two sons who are also helping run the wine business who have studied winemaking in Florence. Uh, Florence, yeah, that's right. Um, not only was this winery a pioneer with starting pri being a private wine in, uh, winery, they've also been pioneers with local grape varieties. So they were first to do Maratheftico as a varietal wine in 2000, uh, first to do Sportico, which we're going to have a look at now in 2007, and then the first to do Primara in 2001. And this is their winery. Um, um, and if you go there, you get treated very handsomely with, you know, local produce. So uh, local cheeses, local jams and so on. So you can have a nice. But the view from the terrace and the view from this part of Cyprus is just stunning. Um, and you can see, you know, you can see from the colour of the soil here that there's a lot of limestone and gypsum in the soil that is actually quite useful for... Um, holding water over the summer when it can be quite hot and dry. It's got good water holding capacity, though it doesn't look it. Um, but yeah, I'm <laughs> it was quite misty that day when... Um, <laughs> it was a good trip up, though, up, up there, because I, the first time I went up there, it had been dark and I hadn't been able to see the view. So, And there's a protected forest all around this area that's absolutely full of orchids and butterflies and it's just fantastic so it's really really beautiful um, and just gorgeous. and this plateau on the top of the hill so you know just to show you the sort of sparseness of the soil and the old vines and so on but the EU is not doing the industry any favours because there are grants available for grubbing up people are grubbing these things up and planting new vines and this this treasure of old vines is at risk of being lost which is why it's really important for us to you know explore these great varieties while they still while they still exist and i think i have a picture of the um so uh, yes so we're at about a thousand meters on this pla uh, plateau and this is the grape variety itself sportico so that's in glass number one for you Mm. Mm. So apparently the name Sportico means bursting because it has very thin skins and it's a bit inclined to, you have to handle it very carefully otherwise the grapes just explode. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there was a chap called um, Akis Sambatas who was a very important figure in the Cyprus wine industry. He was managing director of Kio, which was one of the biggest, one of the big four wine producers. Um, but he studied in Montpellier, and like I said, so many Cypriots go and study abroad. <coughs> he studied in Montpellier and got to know Pierre Gallet, the famous ampelographer, who um, he persuaded to come to Cyprus. And he did quite a lot of work in identifying um, about 12 unique uh, Cyprus grape varieties back then. Um, and Sportico was one of the uh, grape varieties he identified. So traditionally, it was used as a cross-pollinator for Maratheftico, which is, um, doesn't set fruit if you don't have a cross-pollinator for it. And it turns out to be a good cross-pollinator for Maratheftico because it flowers at the same time, which is always quite handy. Um, but also, you know, uh, it's been identified that it can make wines in its own right as well. And if you're going to have to give up part of your vineyard to a cross-pollinator, you might as well see what it can do. Um, hmm. So, so pale coloured, relatively neutral, um, but nice fresh acidity, I think. <coughs> Thank you. 
which when we come on to some of the other Cyprus white grape varieties, you'll see why fresh acidity is quite a, a useful feature for grape vi white vines in Cyprus. So not a terribly complex grape variety, but in the Cyprus climate can make something that's crisp, green apple, refreshing. Um, it's got quite nice length to it. I'll say, I'm not going to say it's the world's most complex grape variety, um, but not everything has to be. And especially on a summer day in Cyprus, something that's crisp and refreshing is actually kind of going to hit the spot. Mm. Uh, so that is a sportico. Mm. And then we shall move on to, so grape variety number two. And it may actually be, because I'm not sure that last time we did this Wines of Cyprus tasting 18 months ago, I'm not sure we had a sportico. So it possibly is the first time some of these grape varieties have been shown in the UK. So this is a real first, I think, for, for you guys to have a chance to taste some of these unique grape varieties. Um, so, number two, Moroccanella. I am sure, unless you've been to Cyprus, you will not have tasted Moroccanella on these shores. Um, and this is the producer, Gerolamo. Um, <clears throat> and the owners of this winery um, were born in the village of Ormodos, which is up at about 900 metres or so. Um, and the winery is close by. So... Dad started bottling wines, uh, red wines only, back in 1987. So he had a long history of, of grapes and zivania, which is Cyprus's local spirit. Um, <clears throat> and the current owners um, of the winery kind of, they actually wanted to not do what their father had done. Um, so they went off and studied something completely different, as many people do. One uh, was a pharmacist and the other went and did computer engineering. But when their parents died and left them the vineyards, it was, uh, they got 20 hectares, which is kind of big enough, you know, to, to actually need to do something with 20 hectares. So they decided that actually it was time that maybe they should do something properly with wine in the, the vineyard. So they decided that at that point, to build a small modern winery in the vineyards um, and carry on and expand and, you know, as part of that, seeing what could be done with the local grape varieties. So Moroccanella actually means little cinnamon. Um, and I'm not, personally, I'm not convinced it smells of cinnamon, but there is quite an exotic. For me, it reminds me a bit of ori uh, mock orange, that kind of orange blossom, mock orange kind of aroma. So it has a slightly exotic aroma, um, which is quite distinctive compared to some of Cyprus's other grape varieties. Um. Mm. And it's a great variety that quite a lot of producers are actually looking at because I think you can see from the, it has this exotic, slightly exotic aroma, but it's not too much. It's not very, it's not like a Muscat or a Gewurztramino. It's not too, too, too powerful on the nose, but it has a nice fruitiness, a nice bit of white peach um, fruitiness, particularly on the palate which is something that maybe some of the other Cypress white grape varieties don't offer. So it's something that gives another dimension to the portfolio of Cypriot grape varieties. So this is the grape itself, and it has these quite sparse bunches and this very distinctive yellow colour. And the grapes have a little point on the end of the, um, of the berries as well, which you can't really see on that picture, but... Um, so I think it's a grape we're going to see more of. It's early days yet. I mean, the first time I tasted this grape variety was probably only two years ago. And people are still at the stage of learning how to get the best out of it and what it can do. 
Um, but I think we'll see more of it because I think it makes something that's very appealing and offers a different dimension. And maybe we'll see people doing some blends as well, which they're not really at the moment, but I think we'll see it. Uh, people playing around with, you know, I'm sure people will try barrels and skin maceration and all sorts of things. But um, apparently it was very widespread before the Ottomans, but nobody quite knows why it died out. But, you know, a, a lot of grape varieties kind of, you know, lost out, especially the lower yielding ones, lost out in the march for high yields and volume and volume and volume in that sort of previous era I was talking about. So there we go. Um, so the next wine I'm going to show you. Oh, no, my slides have gone in the wrong order. OK, so the next wine I'm going to show you is this one. Yes, that is correct. OK, Costas Chakas who um, <clears throat> apparently his grandfather used to have a bit of a business, of, particularly as a wine merchant years ago, but kind of gave up in the 1960s. And Costas went off to actually work as a banker for some time, but eventually decided that actually wine was what he wanted to do and bought a vineyard. And apparently his... Um, grandfather had an absolute heart attack about the idea that anybody would go and try and make wines on a site like this. Um, I mean, it's dramatic, the view out over the mountains here in these little terraces of, of, of grapevines. So this is looking straight out from the front of the winery here. Um, and um, <clears throat> so... Most dense plantings on the island, uh, that's, that's what I wanted to point out to you. You know, the, the rows, the vines are very close together and a long way up. Um, no deliberate single vineyards at the, to start with, but more recently I think he has got some. Um, and, have a, and this is the winery itself up in the mountains. So he's got, you know, I think he's been very smart with uh, the way he's kind of focused on different grape varieties one after the other rather than trying to do lots all at once. So, you know, Zinisteri from very high vineyards, Van Vakauda, as he calls Maratheftico up there, Yanudi was something he added to the portfolio uh, 2013, I think it was, the first vintage, and now Pramara. So... For him, this again, the idea of looking for another dimension, another local grape variety that um, could offer something to the Cyprus portfolio, and playing around with different winemaking techniques. So, So here it actually has four days of skin maceration because I think he said the first time he made it, he wasn't that impressed with it. So he just wanted to experiment. So here, so we've got four days of cold skin maceration, which is where that lovely sort of creamy texture in the mouth comes from. So creamy texture and a little bit of saltiness on the finish there. So heading towards the orange wine direction, but, you know, not orange wine, but with some of that texture and complexity you get from orange, orange wines. So, and so, a few people starting to experiment with this, still small quantities, as I showed you from the vineyards, the harvest statistics. But, you know, I think a really, um, I don't know what's turned up now, right. A really interesting grape variety. Matt, can you do technical support? <laughs> Got a pop up that won't go away. <laughs> Sorry, my poor long suffering son um, always gets to <laughs> gets roped in to do technical support for me. Um, because my husband just always says to me, you shouldn't be allowed a computer. 
and I'm, well, <laughs> sun is less patronising. Okay, vineyards, and this is the grape variety itself, just so you can have a um, have an idea. Again, you know, it's a little bit more green toned than the Moroccanella that we looked at before. Um, so it's quite thick skinned, um, apparently very disease resistant, chalk tolerant, and um, apparently the name means it's early ripening. So it was first mentioned in documents in about 1893. Um, oh, and the other interesting thing about this one is sequential yeast. So they've actually used Torellospora delbrechii and non-saccharomyces yeast to start with, and then a saccharomyces yeast to follow on, which uh, I'm finding, you know, it's quite an interesting technique for adding different complex layers of complexity because Torellospora emphasizes fruity characteristics and then obviously the Saccharomyces can actually finish the fermentation properly, uh, which Torellospora can't. So it's an interesting technique. Anyway, so that's Pramara. I think, you know, looking forward to seeing more of this great variety. I think there's a lot of potential here. Um, so, you know, it's exciting to see being at the beginning. Um, Okay, so now I've got to whiz back, sorry. <laughs> I've not been concentrating when I was... Um... So the next great variety I'm going to show you is actually cheating slightly because it's not white, as you will see from the picture. But I'm interested in the fact that for so many years people have dismissed Mavro as being a bit of a rubbish grape and... You know, what on earth are we going to do with this? We can only make cheap wines or we have to pull it out. So I'm interested to see that people are starting to think, well, we've got all this Mavro. It is unique to Cyprus. Can we do something with it? So we've got people like Marcus Ambartus has find, found a vineyard from 1921 to see what he can do with Mavro as a red grape. Um, and we've got people like this winery, Santorini, um, trying out different things like vinifying it as a white grape. Because one of the complaints about it is that it's a bit inclined to have rustic tannins. So I kind of hadn't come across this wine before, but I was curious to share it with you and see what we thought as to whether this was a potential an interesting way forward with Mavro or not, but by vinifying it white, do you avoid the problem of rustic tannins? Hmm. Um, and another one with some very elderly vineyards here. So some of these vines are 150 years old. Um, so it's whole bunch press just to um, very <coughs> low yielding, 24 hectolitres a hectare. I mean, you can imagine, you know, it's not a very dense planting and they're pretty elderly vines, so they're not giving much yield per, per grape. And apparently, um, when they started, you know, I think people thought they were mad, but now some of the growers nearby are saying to them, you know, will you please use the fruit from our vineyards and look after them so that the vineyards can still exist? Um, which is a nice thing to hear, really. So let's go back to the to here. So um, Daniel, who's the owner, kind of left Cyprus aged 15 to, to go and live in South Africa, but kind of missed home and memories of his grandfather making wine and things in goat skins and so on, and um, came back with his wife to start this project in 2015. Um, and so inspired by memories of his grandfather making wine in these, these typical clay pots that you get all over Cyprus. So kind of bang on trend, really, you know, every, but not many people are reusing them, but I think we will see more as clay is so trendy nowadays. Um, and this, you know, Cyprus has this very long connection with clay jars. It's something that they... Uh, is part of the Cyprus culture and heritage. Um, 
So yeah, so they built themselves a small winery in the vineyard, some new um, plantings around the, the place, but say the real feature is these old vines um, and what can be done with them. So let's have a look at the... So I think if you shut your eyes, you would think it, it smells of red fruit rather than... but. Hmm, like raspberries or something like that. Anyway, I, I'm curious to know what you guys think as well, because this is a bit of a voyage of discovery, <coughs> discovery for me too. And there's some fruit, wait, fruit sweetness on the palate to it. Um, a little bit of that raspberry cordial, maybe a hint of Vimto. If you if you come from up north and remember what Vimto is like, that sort of flavour. Um, little tiny bit of grip on the end as well. Quite an interesting wine, I think. What do you think? Honey? Is anybody making sparkling wine? <coughs> I don't know. Is anybody making sparkling wine, Marcos? Not yet. No, no. <laughs> Oh. It's in the pipeline, right? <laughs> but generally, I would think the problem with Cyprus for sparkling wine is good sparkling wine needs really high acid base wine, and that's not really the strength of Cyprus. <laughs> you could do it maybe, you know, high up, but um, yeah, I'm sure it'll happen because. You know, the, the march of Prosecco for the tourism trade, you know, it would be nice for the local producers to have, have a bit of a share of that. Is it something Camantarena might think about then? No, Marinos, not, not your, your scene. Yeah. But, yeah, so we'll, we'll see. I, I say I can't think that I've tasted any sparkling wine yet, but I'm sure it'll happen. And it sounds like it's, it's in somebody's plans, at least. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Chakas we have looked at, Pramara we've looked at. Okay, Zinisteri, uh, Cyprus's great white grape variety. And its name actually means low acid, which, and if you think about it, you know, you've got this really hot Mediterranean island with massively hot summer temperatures, and you've got your native white grape variety that is inclined to suffer from low acidity. So what do you do about it? You move your vineyards up into the mountains or you blend with a little bit of Sauvignon or a little bit of Semillon or something that can add a little bit of that acidity. But say the, probably the most successful route is going up into the mountains so that the altitude helps keep its freshness. It's not found anywhere else in the world. It's very useful if you ever play grape variety bingo because there are not many grape varieties that start with an X. Uh, but it is, you know, uniquely Cypriot and, you know, really important to the wine industry here. Very much had been treated as a workhorse grape, particularly for volume wines on the, uh, the, on the lower level vineyards. But a lot of work gone into making it you know, exploring its quality dimensions. So first mentioned in 1881, but, you know, there are people who reckon that they've got vines that go back hundreds of years. Um, <clears throat> it's quite vigorous. Um, mid to late ripening, as I said, some of the guys with really high vineyards aren't picking it till November. Um, and it's very drought resistant, which again is quite handy on Cyprus as well. Um, so it's low acid, but it also keeps a reasonably good pH level. So about 3.4 will be quite typical. So even though the total, the titratable acidity might be low, it has good pH, which actually as a winemaker, that's, that's the number that you really care about because that's what helps you keep your wines fresh and in good shape. Um, so... So I've got two to show you here because I wanted to show you two different faces of um, this grape variety. And this was actually one of the first wineries I ever visited in Cyprus. So I've got 
Um, um, so, and it's just on the edge of Paphos, so it's, you know, it's not the most glamorous place for a winery, but at that point, uh, when Ficardos started his winery, he basically set out, started out as a, he had a restaurant and he wanted to make some wine for his restaurant and then it sort of grew from there. So having a, you know, a functional winery building close to the city to where customers were was actually important. And nobody owned vineyards then. It was all bought grapes. So it didn't really matter, you know, there wasn't this model of having a winery in the middle of your vineyards because that just did not happen at that point. Um, but of course it's all changing now and people have, have their own vineyards. So this is one of Ficardas' own vineyards and you can see, you know, it's quite interestingly challenging soil. I mean, you know, it's so chalky and limestoney and so on, but great for white wines particularly, you know. Um, and this is the second generation of the Ficardos family. Ficardos, Ficardos. So some of the family's wines are actually named after, after some of the children and grandchildren. But as Ficardos says, well, you know, I've got my name on every single bottle from the winery. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, so really a pioneer in sort of developing... Uh, wines of his own so it was quite early back in the late 1980s but as everybody moving into vineyards moving into working with specific growers from specific villages so that you know you know that control over fruit quality that's so important and having to work with people to kind of encourage them to you know drop crop and and so on so this zinisteri comes from vineyard to a couple of vineyards predominantly at around 550 to 650 meters so not super high um, and it's a very for me it's kind of a very floral grapey quite expressive on the nose quite inviting on the nose style of zinisteri mm. about 14 hours of cold maceration on the skin so I think you can feel a little bit of that skin texture on the palate. But you can also taste that it's kind of quite smooth because of that low acidity. Uh, that low, yeah, low acidity, that's the word I wanted to, wanted to mention. Mm. And this was, oh, I've got a little picture of their grapes coming in. And this was their harvest, and you can see um, quite sparse bunches, so good air circulation around the fruit, and very, very healthy. I mean, it is a country where disease pressure, I mean, there's a bit of mildew some years, but really it's, you, you don't have to do a lot in terms of spraying or agrochemicals. So a lot of people are kind of pretty much organic by default because you just, most years you don't have to do very much. And if you do have to treat mildew, I think would be the, would be the most common problem. But, um, so, and then next to it, a second dimension of uh, Zinisteri from this winery, which possibly the highest winery itself in Europe is 1140 metres, so you go quite a long way up here. And this winery was sort of started in 1998, and the first vintage was 2002. Um, and it's part, it's a kind of halfway towards being a cooperative because it's owned by 40 villagers and uh, a Greek company called the Fotia, Fotia, I can't even pronounce it, them, <laughs> Greek group. So it's an interesting combination of sort of local growers and, you know, a bigger investor from outside. And um, so... And Minas Mina, the winemaker, who's been here since the beginning. And for him, Zinisteri is kind of, I think it's his soul mate grape. You know, it's, for him, it's, it's like Chardonnay for him. It's the grape that can offer everything. Um, and it's something, I mean, I've been lucky enough to taste uh, with him back several times and to do a vertical tasting back to, to some of the early vintages he made. 
Um, so he studied in Glasgow, as I said, so many winemakers have studied in other places. Done a vintage in New Zealand, um, and he's doing a PhD uh, working on zinisteri, aromatic expression, and yeast, and so on. So, you know, it's a real passion for him, zinisteri. Um, <clears throat> And it's a grape that nobody believes can keep. It's always treated as that drink it in the summer of the first year of the harvest. But if you go to the winery, he will take you through and show you, if you're lucky and ask nicely, 10-year-old Zinisteri wines that are in beautiful condition and really expressive. So it's really... And I think while most people will never keep a wine like this, it's an important part of the credibility of the grape that it does have this potential for keeping, I feel. So it's exciting when you get that opportunity. So what we have with Petritus is um, it's usually about 20% barrel fermented and it has about six months on lees. So, and because they're very high up, it's uh, usually harvested pretty late in the year. Mm. Mm. So there's lovely texture and complexity here. Nicely balanced acidity. It's again, it's not high acidity, but lovely length in the mouth as well. So just a little bit more complexity and so on on the palate. And I think the, the Ficardus one was about the aromatics and here I think we're about the complexity and the weight and the length on the palate. So, and I just wanted to show you two different dimensions of this important grape variety for Cyprus. And there are lots more downstairs to go and taste. Some really exciting wines, some single vineyard expressions, some new PDO expressions. So, please, please go and taste some of the other wines downstairs. Uh, anything else you wanted to add that I've said wrong about Zinisteri? Um, OK, I've got photobombed. So this is just showing you some of the really high vineyards and I got photobombed by a swallow. So I like that photo. <laughs> just making the point about, you know, surrounded by mountains. Mountains are so important in the viticulture in Cyprus. Caroline, yes. I want to add mm. that uh, now is under quarantine in Australia. Oh, OK. So uh, Ooh. Right. <laughs> oh, okay. Is that is that being grown potentially grown by someone with a connection to Cyprus then, or is is it potentially being grown by someone with a connection to Cyprus, Cyprus ancestry? It's a PhD done by a good friend of mine. Mm. Who studied together. Mm. He's doing his PhD on Sinisteri now on Cypriot wine suitability in the Australian market. Mm, okay. So the cuttings are already there. Okay. They are in uh, South Australia now, so that the Adelaide University is uh, behind the whole thing. Mm. Exciting. Mm. We shall see. Yeah. 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 Why not? Mm. Well, and this is a view from the one of the highest vineyards in Europe. This is the. Uh, 1450 meter vineyard just to show you again looking how high up you are practically ears popping when you get up here um, okay so I couldn't do um, a tasting of Cyprus really without coming on to Cyprus's world famous king of wines and wine of kings um, Commanderia um, and we're going to start off by showing you um, a wine from the 2002 vintage from Sodap. And this is the winemaker at Sodap. Mm. Um, and I picked this one to show because I wanted to so show there are two great varieties allowed for Commanderia, Mavro and Zinisteri. And I wanted to include this, this one we've got here because it's 100% Zinisteri. So I wanted to show you Commanderia made from the, the white grape variety. Um, most Commanderias will be a, a mixture of both. Some mostly Mavro, 
uh, summer mixture, but I think this is really interesting to show you what it does on its own. So he's actually originally from Venezuela, and I don't think I ever found out the story of how on earth a Venezuelan winemaker ended up in Cyprus, but uh, I'm sure Marinos can tell us later. So Sodap is the biggest producer on the island and um, responsible for about 40% of the island's crush. Um, and it's a cooperative, unlike the other. And it's the only one that really has remained properly big, I suppose, out of the form of Big Four. But it's reinvented itself um, <coughs> because they moved up completely from the coast up into the mountains to the village of Strumbi um, and got everything re-equipped. Um, so it's, you know, proper modern equipment. Um, so grow. And this is another Cyprus bit of scenery. I think I took this from the winery or somewhere near the winery. Anyway, so uh, Commanderia is made from sun-dried grapes, and so in, the case, in this case it is 100% Zinisteri. Um, and fortification used to be um, a thing, but now more and more people are making it without fortification and just natural concentration of sugars. Is yours fortified or not, Marinos? It is, yeah. But quite subtly fortified, so you will see Fortified and non-fortified, but the key being to, you know, make sure that the alcohol is in balance with those lovely sort of dried dates and marmalade and chocolatey coffee kind of characteristics here. And just, you know, this is 2002 vintage. Again, most commanderias, I would say the typical standard tourist commanderia would be a blend of different vintages. Uh, but in a good vintage, you know, they'll produce a single vintage one. Um, and, um, you know, this is a 16-year-old wine now and still just fabulous. This is a very long-lived wine, Commanderia. So sun-dried grapes, lengthy oak aging, fortification or not, depending on, on the winemaker's style. <coughs> Mm. There's lovely freshness and vibrancy to it as well, still. Just delicious wine, and it keeps winning gold medals all over the place. I'm not surprised. Um, length, balance, so, yeah. But, yeah. Mm. Yes, they're, they're, they're usually older barrels. Does anybody know whether? <coughs> you... mm. oh. <coughs> right, there we go. And it's mm. Mm. so it's exciting to see because Commanderia, even though it was, you know, it's the island's world famous wine for many years was a bit stuck in a rut, I think, and basically only sold to tourists at the airport and for special occasions. And Cypriots themselves didn't really want to drink it because they associated it with having to go to church and that sort of thing. But the last, I don't know, five, ten years, a lot of people have started to say, do you know what, this is our island's treasure. We should really explore what, what this can do and what, what we can do with it. So. A lot of the new generation winemakers are starting to do things with Commanderia, um, experimenting with different uh, oak regimes, shorter aging, longer aging. I think it's got to be a minimum of two years in oak, but longer for some people are going for much longer. And just trying out different dimensions, different drying techniques, different blends. So there's again, some really exciting new generation Commanderias appearing that apparently Cypriots are now drinking, which is a, you know, a big step forward that Cypriots can be proud of their own wine again rather than flogging it all to tourists. So, um, uh, and this is a picture of Zinisteri drying. It was uh, from a different winery, but I just, and that's Mavro drying at the back. So just to see, just show you, it just gets laid out on mats in the sunshine. Um, 
So then the final wine, then, oh, St. Barnabas, um, all the big guys name their commander <coughs> ears after saints, sort of going back to the time of the Knights Templars, that when perhaps commander ear was put on the map with uh, King John, who served it at his wedding and, and so on. So there's always been a bit of a sort of religious connection with this, this wine, <coughs> going back to that history. So then the final wine to show you is another dimension of Commanderia, uh, the Anama concept. So the original name for it was Nama. Um, <clears throat> and this is the view from the vineyard of this winery. So they have five acres overlooking the sea. There's a sea in the background towards Limassol. Um, and these guys have about 70% Mavro. So we've got a blend here of Mavro and Zinisteri to show you the other sort of facet. Um, and they started this project in, say it says here 2009, but as this is a 2008 wine, they must have started it before 2009. Maybe that's when they first launched on the market. Okay, thank you. And um, so Mavro for them is really important. This is the the bunch of grapes again and they've got 100, 100 year old plus what vines in their vineyards um, and they feel as a, as a couple that own this winery that it's very underrated so hence you know it's an important part of their style of, of commander ear um, and there are a couple so he is an enologist and the managing director studied winemaking in Athens and worked in various wineries in Greece and New Zealand and sort of did the tour as everybody did but wanted to come back and do something in his homeland with you know a, a wine that's so important as to Cypriots and um, his wife Christina is a jewellery designer so she um, you know, if you go downstairs and have a look at the bottles, each one is beautifully designed and distinctive and beautifully wrapped and presented. Uh, but all the bling presentation, and I think it's, bling is not a fair word because I think it's very elegant as well. It, beautiful gift, uh, which obviously a lot of commander ear is. But, you know, there has to be an interesting liquid in there as well. Um, so, so the two of them have brought together their ideas of the winemaking and presentation and so on and so on. Um, so, and this wine I'm showing you here is actually one number, bottle number 106 out of 300 and, I can't read it now, 65 or something like that barrel. So it's not very many. So it's something that's really special. Uh, and so what they decided to do was when they had a particularly good vintage or something that they were really interested in keep a barrel to one side for longer aging so this had 92 months in barrel um, so lots of depth and complexity so I've only poured you a small amount because it's a you know very rare wine but we're quite privileged to be able to have a bottle of it here And a different dimension again, you know, different layers, lovely intensity of fruit, but the Mavro perhaps gives it a little bit more robust structure, but maybe that's helped it with that long aging. So you've got all that coffee and dates and hint of truffles in there and just, and it just lingers in the mouth for such a long time. So, um, I've kept your attention, I think, for long enough. Um, but what I hope is that you've seen an inspiring and interesting range of wines, a new face to Cyprus wines, and that it encourages you to go and explore more. Because I think these are wines that really do deserve a place on the, on the world's wine shelves and wine lists. And... Um, I think it's a really, really exciting and dynamic wine scene. So I hope you found some good wines. hope you found some inspiring wines. And um, I hope you've 
well, I hope you've enjoyed them and I hope you found what I had to say interesting as well. So thank you so much for your attention and please go and enjoy the rest of the tasting. Mm. Mm. Oh yeah, I should mention very early wine drinkers on the Paphos mosaics as well. You have to go and see them if you go to Cyprus. And there you go. Um, that's it. So yeah, if anybody's got any questions or comments or whatever, uh, I'm, I'm here. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Dimitri Walters. Before I kick off about the red wines of Cyprus, welcome to the Vintners Company. This is the spiritual home of wine in this country. This dates from the 14th century, this building, albeit rebuilt above the foundation levels in 1670. As with most of the other buildings in this part of the city, it was burnt down in the Great Fire in 1666. This company, this livery company, one of the great 12 guilds of the city of London, made its money through wine. And it made its money from monopolizing French wine. Remember when a lot of France belonged to England in the 14th and 15th century, this company had the monopoly on all Gascon wine coming into the country. This is the right place to have a tasting of this sort because in 1363, Edward III hosted a dinner in the, in the refectory downstairs, later rebuilt, with the King of France, then his captive, the King of Scotland, then his captive, Valdemar of Denmark, and King Peter of Cyprus, the Lusinian King of Cyprus. Peter had an ulterior motive for coming to dinner. He wanted money. He wanted money for the Crusades to go and attack the Turks. Sorry, Melissa. To go and attack the Turks and to attack the Egyptians, the Mamluks, and he came for dinner, and the wine of the evening was Comandaria, one of the oldest wines in continuous production in the world. Anyway, today's tasting is going to be anecdotal. Nine wines in one hour. It's going to be pretty quick. There are quite a few winemakers in the room, Zambatas, uh, Vlasidis, Aguiridis, and who else is here? Is Aphrodite here? Yes. yes. And, uh, and Sangaridis as well, and others I haven't, haven't noticed. Please speak up, but don't be too long, because we haven't got long. We need to go downstairs and taste more wine by the end of, of today. I remember a time, I'm in my early 50s, I know it's hard to believe. I'm in my, my early, I look at least 60 today. I remember a time when Cyprus red wine, without a shadow of a doubt, was undrinkable. I think those amongst us who are middle-aged and older remember that time. The main markets until 1989 were the former Soviet Union and Bulgaria. And it was bulk shipped. I remember your father telling me that there used to be a pipeline from a pontoon in Limassol Harbor where literally Russian ships would pull up alongside the end of this pier and someone at Kiev would turn a tap and it would just fill up the ship. Was that true, do you think? Sad, isn't it? But that's what happened. So, guess what happened? The Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Communism all but died out. And uh, Cyprus had no export markets. They died out overnight. Quality wasn't the order of the day. For the last 15 years or so, let's say 20 years, because there are some wineries here, that have been plying their trade since the late 80s, early 90s. But from that time, things began to change. They're still changing. Saying there's a typical Maratheftiko, or a typical Yanuvi, or a typical Ophthalmo, or a typical Lefkada, or a typical Shiraz on Cyprus is pretty hard. It really is quite difficult. But what, for me, these red grapes have is a very convincing story that will not only help the home market, distinguish itself, but in the future will help drive exports. These red grapes, particularly the native ones rather, are not that easy to grow. We'll get into that. Today, the tasting is going to consist of just that, tasting the wine, a few observations on the smallest screen in the world. I'm sorry about this. This is something you'd have in your bedroom at home, but it's, it's what we have. If you want to ask questions, I will read out, <laughs> I'll read out what I've written here for you. This is, uh, this is um, a photograph, as with, with all the photographs, to give an impression of, uh, of what the, the vineyards look like. In this case, this is actually at Mandria, isn't it? This is, this is a photograph, a regional photograph of your... Of your so, pretty close. All right. Old vines being the order of the day with this wine. This is um, just up here in the Krasochoria, 
the main wine producing region of Cyprus. For those of you who haven't seen a map of Cyprus for a while, I'm going to show you exactly where, where the wine or where the, the vineyards are. I put a yellow dot, which those of you at the back of the room will need a telescope to see, so I will just point to it each time. What makes this wine unusual is it's from that much maligned grape, Mavro. It's, um, it's not the most respectful thing to call a grape black or white. It's like calling your child boy or girl. So this is a field blend. This is actually, in a way, the most honest wine here because what it is, is something that's very traditional. Having said that, it could be called varietal Mavro. Mavro was the workhorse grape of, uh, of Cyprus it, uh, until very recently, as well as being a winemaking grape of dubious quality, particularly with younger wines, it's a great eating grape, produces lots of sugar. It's an important part of the Comandaria blend, actually less and less so. It's of great delight to me to see people experimenting with Mavro. I was having a conversation with a, a, another um, master wine colleague of mine, Angela Muir downstairs, Angela, are you here? She said she was going to come, but she didn't. She's downstairs still. I think she's forgotten. Anyway, she was saying this, this grape is of dubious quality still, except with very old vines at some altitude. It doesn't produce much color, not so important. It produces quite a lot of alcohol, lots of sugar. Its tannins are either there or they're not. It's difficult to extract without extracting too much. So this is a single vineyard near Mandria, where that spot was I showed you, near Omodos and Aos Nicolas in the Krasochoria, at about 900 meters, <coughs> slate, shale, and decayed limestone. What makes this rather special is these vines were planted in 1921. That means that actually we have something to work with here. It's a bit of a myth that grape wine is made from old vines, but you have more of a chance to make grape wine with old vines. 5% of this, though, is not Mavro. It's interplanted with Maratheftico vines, Yanuvi, the two ascendant native red grapes. And also, the one thing I really love about this, there's a red grape, Marcos tells me, no one knows what it is. What an exciting place to make wine, but you still don't know what the vines are. This is not just, uh, they just genuinely don't, don't yet know what this grape is. In this vineyard, there's also an unusual white grape still being discovered, Canela, and the, uh, the main white grape of the island, Sinisteri. To recap about Mavro, I wrote my um, MW thesis on the red grapes of, of Cyprus. That was, I finished it seven years ago or so. It's already out of date. But when I wrote it, Mavro was about um, something like 85% of red plantings and 65% of total plantings. That's dramatically reduced. So it's less than, um, less than half of red plantings now. Sadly, it's not the native red grapes that have filled the void because they're quite difficult to, to um, propagate, propagate and replicate. It's the international varieties like Shiraz, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and, um, and, and, uh, and Cabernet Sauvignon, and, and Mouverdre. So this used to be the workhorse grape. Made with indigenous yeast, stainless steel, fairly high temperature. It's not a, not a particularly fruity wine. This is unsulfured as yet. It's a barrel sample. Three to four-year-old used barrique. What do you think? You can tell him he's in the room. I like it. I like the bitter cherry character. This is a work in progress. There are so few other varietal or near varietal Mavros to compare it against. But it's rather light and delicate. It has a slightly um, sort of Gamay-esque character to it, albeit not as fruity. Marcos, do you think the Maratheftico and the Yanuvi actually contribute a discernible character to this wine. They definitely contribute when it comes to the color. Yeah, because um, Mavro has so little color. Probably a bit to the body of the wine as well. Mm. Okay. 
please give your comments along the way. We now get into the two, I told you it was going to be quick, the two next wines, both made from this indigenous variety, Maratheftico, a.k.a. Vamvacada. Mouifre, the French ambulographer, when he came to Cyprus in 1893, talked about Marafofico. It's genetically close to another grape, Aspartame. It's vigorous, but prone to poor flower formation, flower shedding, and poor fruit set. This is a problem not just with Marafefteco, but to a lesser degree, Yanuthi as well. Marafefteco is monaceous. It's only female. It needs other vines close by or interplanted to actually pollinate it. In that respect, it's not your friend. It's expensive to grow grapes that way. Because it's prone to poor flower set, um, poor flowering and poor fruit set, you also end up with small green bullet-like berries in the bunches. The bunches are quite long and stringy. It has successional flowering, and so successional bunches, which means even if you aren't a fan of green harvesting, there has to be a certain amount of green harvesting in order to, to end up with bunches that are fully physiologically, phenolically ripe and with sufficient sugars in them. It's early budding, late ripening, has a long hang time, or can do. Susceptible to powdery mildew, I would hazard a guess in most of Cyprus, particularly in this area, which is dry, and at some altitude, it's not a major problem. Deeply colored, firm tannins. When I wrote my, my uh, treatise on this, it was about 1% of plantings. Now, it's about 3 of red plantings. So, some, some progress, but it's rather, I it's rather, um, wouldn't say galling, but it's uh, frustrating that the two really important red varieties are still so rare, but they're a work in progress. Anyway, this particular wine, Angelos, this is not your vineyard, but I needed some photographs, so I used this one. This is actually something I took in Ezusa, but that quite well describes the problem with uh, Maratheftico. And this is, number two, is um, Angelos Xangaridis wines, wine, uh, his Maratheftico. <laughs> you can see ripe berries and unripe berries, medium ripe berries. It's difficult to grow. This is the usual case with Maratheftico, bush vines, but some people also trellis it. Here we are in the Paphos areas, in the Paphos area, the um, Vuni Paneya area of, uh, of Cyprus in Lamona. So this is a single vineyard on VSP, so this is trellised. 450 meters elevation, much lower elevation than you'd find in much of the rest of the island. The west of Cyprus is wetter and cooler. You don't need to go so high. You can actually afford to be lower down. The soil here, rather than the active limestone you find in much of the Krasochoria, is loam and clay. Fermentation in stainless steel, and then goes into barrels. Some new for five months. Is this entirely organic? Yes. It is, OK. So Lucia and Angelos started this outfit in 2005. How much of your production is Maratheftico? Tiny amount. How much are you planting up? Are you regularly replanting or adding? In Cyprus, until quite recently, the power of the vineyards was amongst all the growers. The power of winemaking was with the big four, people like Sodap, Eco, Loel, Keo, the big four producers who didn't only make wine. They made um, spirit, they made beer, fruit juice, depending on who they were. But the vineyards were owned by the, by the village people. 
So actually getting control of vines, getting control of vineyards in an area where viticultural land and building land are pretty much the same price is difficult. It's a slow process, but it's beginning to happen, as is proof with this man. I think the average holding in years gone by was just a hectare or two. Now, the properties are getting much larger, but still small. Here's a wintry scene. This is from Rebecca Agaridis. And here we are, back in the Krasochoria. And we're on the hillside of Laona, near the village of Vasa. Rebecca has eight hectares at altitudes of between 950 and 1,100 meters. If you compare this to the rest of Europe, this sounds impossibly high, and these aren't even the highest. Well, you think, those of you who've been to Sicily, you know how much of Sicily is very desiccated, very dry, very hot. Southern Spain, very dry, very hot. Most of Greece and Crete are not. They're warm, but no, nowhere near as hot as Cyprus. Climatically, similar to Judean hills in Israel, to parts of the Beka Valley, parts of, of Sicily. So to go closer to God gives you less heat, gives you stronger diurnal shift, cooler nights and cooler days, but a bigger shift between them, which is great for retaining acidity <coughs> and developing um, flavor and aroma compounds. But the problem with altitude, of course, is with grapes that already have a lot of tannin in their skins, is you end up with more tannin that you have to work with to ripen. Small total production. Rebecca, is she in the room? Yes. You're aiming for 35,000 yes. bottles. So this is small, but you're growing quite substantially from 28,000. You produce 6,000 bottles of this. Are you going to increase your production of this? Yeah. Okay, which is quite big in the context of just under eight hectares. So back in the Krasochoria, based on decayed limestone, it's almost like chalk, most of the limestone in this area. And these, again, are trellised vines. Some of them, I'd say most Malafevtica of my acquaintance, is actually bush vines, like the photograph I showed you. The better thing about trellising Malafevtica is because of its successional flowering, you can actually control that flowering and get rid of some of the early bunches and just, just focus on the bunches that you want to, to ripen. Mature for 12 months in an element of new oak. First vintage of this in seven. They're quite different, aren't they? But they both have that rather nice Italian bitter cherry character. <coughs> I notice with a lot of Hellenic red grapes, not just on Cyprus, but in Greece as well, whilst they can be distinguished from Italian, Italian uh, grapes, there's something in common. That um, it's slightly powdery tannins, the expens expansive mouthfeel, the high acidity. None of these vines, as far as, as far as I'm aware, are planted on grafted rootstocks. There's no phylloxera in Cyprus, a bit like Chile. So all of these wines, are made from vines on their own rootstocks, which I think to a degree says a lot about the way they taste and also the perception of acidity. I, I don't know this for, for a fact, but I think there's um, a correlation between low pH and, and uh, ungrafted rootstocks. We've had Mavro, two Marathefticos, you kind of get the picture. They taste related, don't they? Different characters. Pale Mavro, deeply hued Marathevtico, difficult to grow, prone to flower shedding, prone to successional flowering, and um, the difficulties associated with that. Here is little Yanis, a grape that has recently been rediscovered, something that's been around according to its, um, its genealogy, for a long time. So this was found 
allegedly, quite recently, in the garden of Mr. Yanis, Mr. John, a recent discovery. In extent, somewhere around 30 hectares in total on the island. Not much at all. Cyprus is a small island. Its production shrank dramatically after bulk shipments ceased. They're expanding again, but instead of the, uh, the less good vineyards used for bulk production, it's the better vineyards, usually at altitude, in the right places, that are being exploited. Its characteristics are not yet fully understood. It's difficult to grow, tricky to cultivate, like Marathefteco. It's monaceous, so female only. It needs to be fertilized by other vines that aren't, that aren't uh, Yanuvi, like Spurtico, Promara, etc. It has an affinity for wood, a bit like Marathefteco. A bit like Marathefteco, it has firm tannins. The one thing that it has on its side, which I was discuss dis discussing with Vlasidis, where is he? Yeah. Do you know? is um, he, he was saying, telling me, that it's actually easier to grow. It doesn't have successional flowering. So once this difficult flowering is sorted out, because it's female only, actually, from then on, it's easier work. One thing I've noticed, though, with all Yanuvi, and I noticed it with this when I was double decanting it, is a bit like Shiraz and some other red grapes, it's very reductive. You get a buildup of reduced sulfur compounds. I think double decanting has helped. However, these are very young samples. A work in progress, something that shows enormous potential. Less stringy bunches than Marathefteco, slightly bigger berries, but equally firm tannins. Any Thachaki in the room? No? This is made by Costa Chacas from fruit up in the edge of the Pizzilia range, the highest part of the mountain vineyards of Cyprus. Here's a 15 hectare estate, quite large by the, the standards of Cyprus, between 800 meters and 1500 meters, with the winery at 1,000 meters. It's organic, it's volcanic. Rather than a volcano itself, there was an updwelling of magma. And as the limestone became eroded away over eons and eons, the volcanic soil appeared. There's also schist, the same soil you have, the white soil you have in the Doru Valley at the port region, and also sandy loam. This is fairly traditional red wine making, followed by a year in French and American wood. And then a year of bottle age, which I think is wise with this reductive grape prior to release. And the, the Chacas established their winery 30 years ago. Rather different from the Marathefteco, isn't it? Slightly fruitier. Actually, the tannins here are a little bit more pliant. another scenic view. We're now in the west of the island with number five. And we're in Vuni Panaya Ampelitis in the Paphos district, looking out towards the Paphos forest. This area is distinctly cooler and wetter in winter and spring and has autumns that can be quite wet as well, compared to the Pizzilia and Crasochoria. Here we are. Here's the Trodos Range and the Paphos Forest at this end of it. Have you seen, compared to the rest of the area, there are hardly any villages at all. It's the, the empty part of Cyprus. So here we are, number five, at 
Pano Panaya. This was one of the very first small private estates in Cyprus, as recently as 1987, right on the edge of the Paphos forest. Also, one of the largest outfits. For me, their claim to fame has to be championing native varieties, all planted on their own rootstocks, which is quite normal in Cyprus. It's safe to do so until such time as it's not safe to do so. And then we'll soon find out the disaster that ensues if, uh, if any diseases come onto the island. So, is it? No? Yes. No vines at all? So how, does, how will Cyprus um, vary its genetic vine material? Oh dear. <laughs> That's true. So the Turkish part of the island is not controlled, which means phylloxera can... Yeah. That it's not, you know, Particularly if they have interesting vine material that, that, that people in the south want to propagate. Yeah. I'm sure, I was going to say the government will find an answer. I'm not sure they will, but I'm sure someone with uh, intelligent nurseryman ideas will have an idea of how to propagate interesting vine material, genetic vine material. I think banning imports of any genetic material is... Basically, you can do it through the government uh, under... Uh, strict legislation, strict regulation. Uh, oh, so you can do it, okay. Yes, so you, they, they will uh, plant them in their uh, area where it's away from other vineyards. And if it's something that comes out to be good, then they are going to propagate it and give down a Zakagi and places like that, uh, the test point. Okay. <coughs> That's interesting. I'd like to visit. So, here we have Yanudi. It's also grown alongside Mavro, which they're experimenting with, as, as well as Maratheftiko. The one grape you don't see in this tasting, I'm afraid, because it's, it's quite neglected, but I hope it'll be used other than for rosé, is ophthalmo, or eye, or bullseye as it's known. It produces very, very pale wines, quite fruity, works very well with cool fermentation, um, inert vessels like stainless steel. So here we have Yanuvi as being a very small part of the Kiriakidis production. Most of their vineyards range at fairly high altitude, certainly high altitude for this cooler, wetter part of Cyprus, between 850 and 1,150 meters. There's hardly anywhere in Europe that grows grapes at this height. Parts of Sicily, Mount Etna, has vineyards up to 1,150. That really is quite delicate and fruity. It's a different style from the more robust, the more robust Yanudi we had before. Here is a grape that has been adopted. Vertsami, Lefkada, Lefkas. The name gives away the origin from the island of Lefkas in the Ionian Sea of Greece. And it's native to Lefkada, to that island. Um, you also find it in, in other Ionian islands as well, and parts of the western mainland in the Peloponnesus. It's not really a native of Cyprus. It's become a native of Cyprus. It's been adopted. And I think before long, plantings in Cyprus might outstrip plantings in Greece. The set suggestions are the Vetsami, a.k.a. Lefkada, Matsemino, Italian, um, Northern Italy's native grape, or one of them, share an ancestor. Doesn't, doesn't sound surprising at all, considering that under Venetian rule, Cyprus and the Ionian Islands were part of the Venetian Empire. Produces compact bunches of thick-skinned, medium-sized berries, 
It's vigorous, it's prolific, mid to late ripening, fairly good disease resistance. Again, susceptible to downy mildew, which again, I would say is not such a problem in most of Cyprus. Where it's different from the previous two, Maratheftagon Yanuvi, it tends to prefer lower elevations. And in the west of Cyprus, does better at elevations well below 800 meters, around about five or 600 meters. Deeply col colored, sometimes used as a, as a, as a tenturia grape. Hmm? Got it? Oh, you haven't got one? Uh, maybe you can share a bit with him. Is there any more of number six for this gentleman at the front? Porus? Could you come in? Thanks. So I can carry on. It's all right, they're shared, they've shared. Generosity, one out. It's often used as a blending agent for its color and for its expansiveness. Not quite so tannic as the previous two, but still a grape that's native to this kind of environment. Here we are in the far west of Cyprus. You're overlooking the sea here. But these vineyards are about a thousand meters up, just here. I'm talking rubbish, 700 meters up. Pretty high though, isn't it? So lo located in the Laona Akamas region, close to the sea, just about five kilometers. There's a beneficial microclimate, cooling sea breezes, limestone and clay, which is the usual, but not the only combination of soils in Cyprus from not old vines, but certainly well-established vines. 20 years old is, is quite something for what is effectively a pretty new story in Cyprus. Again, a fairly large production, 300,000 litres, of which 7,000 are Lefkada. So a small part of a much bigger story, but a very important part of their story at the top end of production. Here's how it's made. Cool fermentation, maceration, to extract color, extract flavor compounds, aroma compounds, followed by a fairly short and gentle extraction. This wine has a lot of phenols that it wants to over extract and make the wine overly tannic. So the extraction process is fairly short and fairly gentle, otherwise quite classic. 25% of the wine aged in 300 litre French oak barriques for six months and then matured for a further two years, that's quite a working capital, prior to release. And the Kiriakidis family of Vasilikon have been making this or have been making wine since 1993. A little bit reduced today. But wines like this need time in bottle. They need fairly oxidative handling in order to, to stay that reduction. I love this photograph. This is a, a picture of my mother's village in, uh, in Cyprus. This is, um, this is Pachna, back in the Krasohoria region on the, uh, towards the south coast of Cyprus. Just before Vasa, yes. On the right hand side, there's a little chapel on a hill called Ay Marina. Look at the red soils. There's a lot of iron rich clay in the soil here. Here we are, about nine miles from the sea, albeit at about 2,300, 750 meters. I was talking to Marcos, who made this earlier, Zambatas, and I said, why is it some years Lefkada leads the blend, some years Shiraz leads the blend? The answer is, in your own words. Depends on Lefkada can be very hard to mature, so we really need to uh, look out for the vineyards that they're really, uh, the grapes are really mature because of that tanning characteristic. It's not always easy. Thankfully, we've planted Lefkada, so 
this problem will yeah. solve itself in a few years. Yeah. So, not the most reliable production with Lefkada, or indeed with any of these native grapes, but sometimes the most interesting things require a little bit of work on our part, or more than a little bit of work with Manatheftico. Just 3,500 bottles of, of this one, the 2015 Shiraz Lefkada. In 14, it was Lefkada Shiraz. So the Shiraz is from Pakna, and most of the Lefkada from Malia and Vuni, which are pretty close by. Very similar substrate. It says chalky soils. It isn't actually chalk as you'd experience in this country or northern France. It's friable limestone, but very similar. All unirrigated bush vines. Any particularly old vines involved in this? No, Shiraz hasn't been around for so long. All right, okay. Most of the old vines in this region are Opthalmo, if it hasn't been grubbed up, Maratheftico, and also Mavro. Still some old vine Mavro around Pacna. So following sorting, gentle crushing, and fermentation with cultured yeasts, cool fermentation, light pressing, MLF, and then just over a year in one and two year old barrels, 85% French and 15% American, just to add a juiciness factor to the left carter, which is pretty tannic and astringent on the palate in its youth. American oak with its coconutty, um, so sort of desiccated coconut and banana lactone flavors makes that, particularly in the wine's youth, rather more charming. Any questions so far? How are your gums? <laughs> With some of these, it's a bit like sucking a slug, isn't it? Not that I've ever tried. <laughs> and here we have the sexiest winery in Cyprus, owned by the gentleman at the back of the room. Not the sexiest winery. <laughs> That's a matter for opinion. This, um, this winery is in a very beautiful valley in Kilani, in the Krasochoria, and um, it blends into its landscape. You can see the majority of the winery is actually backed into the hillside. It doesn't stand out like a sore thumb in this beautiful, exotic landscape. Many of the vines have been planted to trellis. Some are bush vine. What sort of proportion, one to the other? Is it mostly trellised? 80 20, mostly trellised, some bush vine. What do you have? Old vines are still bush. Yeah. Slowly, slowly. Oh, really? You want to keep some of them? <laughs> here we are. So, Pakna's just here, about um, another 10 miles away. Here. Yes. It's the center of the, uni you, center of the universe. Or it was pitching yeah, to the right, to the left, so this is the center. It is the center, yeah. <laughs> so here we are, a seven hectare vineyard. If any of this is wrong, it's all your fault because you gave it to me. Seven hectare vineyard around. Plus 13. 15. Plus 13. Plus 13. Okay, but seven around the vineyard, around the, around, uh, the around the winery, at around 850 meters, so um, higher up than Pacna in that area, similar to Mandria, when, where Marcos gets his Mavro fruit from. You also take fruit from vineyards up to, the, up to 20 hectares in total, and you're between 700 and 1,000 meters in total. Okay, limestone again with some clay. <coughs> You've seen the winery, an ergonomic, contoured, state-of-the-art winery. Those are my words. Amongst the vines of the estate, completed just five years, six years ago. Mostly trellised, as you heard from the man. And Sophocleus, when he came out of Davis, UC Davis, in 1998, he came back to his own country and decided to put what he'd learned into practice. Just an input to the information. 
nowadays more and more so still implanted. We definitely what new is planted is based on secret variety. Thank you. I'm delighted to hear it. I remember a time when you said no, 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 just international varieties. <laughs> no, it's good. Open mindedness. It's a wonderful thing. So, that is wine number eight. Out of all the international varieties grown on Cyprus, this a Mataro Mouverge must be the ones that are best adapted to high altitude planting, to extreme to an extreme Mediterranean climate where it doesn't rain for five to six months of the year, where there's strong diurnal shift, cold nights, warm days, extreme ultraviolet light, and that work as blending agents too. Shiraz has done very well. Shiraz actually doesn't do so well in extreme heat. It's planted usually at quite high altitude and ripens well at high altitude. It produces very healthy bunches in this climate and is reliable. You think, what is the advantage of international varieties over native varieties? Well, we all know what Cabernet Sauvignon can do. We all know what Shiraz can do, Syrah, Grenache, Grenache Noir, etc. We don't necessarily know what they can do in this environment, but you can experiment. Whereas actually using your own varieties that you, that you your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, blah, 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 back to the dawn of time have used, is a trickier proposition. It's more difficult. And it's these native varieties where, where much of the, the focus is going because they are so tricky, they are so difficult. And finally, you know, I've been even less than an hour. It's been a lightning tour, so we can go back and taste. Here we are in the Pizzilia range, in the center of the universe, center of Cyprus anyway, in, uh, in uh, the Pizzilia range of the overall Limassol range. And Keperunda, as you may have tasted downstairs, are very well known for their Xinisteri, the Petritis well known for their Comandaria, for their native varieties. In fact, they're even experimenting with Asietico. But they also produce this Shiraz Cabernet Sauvignon blend. And most of the grapes here that make this Epos, well, they come from here, but they also come from a vineyard that is up to about 1,400 meters. That's pretty high. And it's like an amphitheater. There have been works afoot for the last X number of years to expand the vineyard, or the overall vineyard. There's a lot of trellising going on. But here, in the, in the, uh, in the vineyards that make Epos, it's going to remain the same size. And it's three tiers of vines, Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon. The highest vineyards in Europe are actually situated nearby at Hundria, at 1,550 meters. Here, in this particular part of Kiperunda, it's a sandy clay hillside in what is otherwise a markedly granitic terrain. Extremely steep vineyards. Temperature-wise, a lot cooler than most of the other vineyards we've, we've been to by sheer virtue of its elevation and its exposure to the elements. This vineyard benefits from low yields, usually small buried fruit, and low temperatures at night particularly. In winter, pretty much every year, there's quite a lot of snow. I'm lucky enough in Cyprus to have the use of my parents' Land Rover, and up there you need it. It's, it's snowy. Chardonnay and Sinisteria are also grown up here, but it's Cabernet, uh, Cabernet uh, Sauvignon and Shiraz that go into the Epos Red, obviously. The Epos White is a blend of, of white grapes. This is 50-50. This is something that's very important on Cyprus, is a network of 
distribution, getting your wines to the market in a less developed market than that which we enjoy here is, is something that you know, we take for granted. We can go to a, a supermarket, we can go to a, a wine merchant, we can go to a restaurant, you get a, a continuous story. In Cyprus, it's not the case. It's becoming the case, but having a secure distribution network, whether it's a small one, you and a few partners, in the case of Chakas, for instance, and Agerides and Flasidis, or it's your own distri distribution network, the Fortiadis group who own Kibarunda, it's vital. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed tasting these wines, this whistle-stop whistle tour of Red Cyprus, to show you that the story has changed more than subtly. The story has changed out of sight, not just for the up-and-coming native grapes with ancient genetic vine material <coughs> coming out of the vineyard, but also how well some international varieties can do and how these winemakers are making sense of these vines in some of the most extreme conditions in Europe, if not the world. Thank you very much for listening, and please ask any questions. For those of you who want facts and figures, I have a couple of, um, a couple of spreadsheets after this, but you will need a telescope to see them. They look tiny on this little tiny, tiny screen. Cheers. Thank you. Γεια σας κύριε και κύριοι, μαζί μας έχουμε τον Δημήτρη Walters, είναι ειδικός στα θέματα κρασιού, είδα άλλος Master of Wine, είναι από τους λίγους παγκοσμίως. So, Dimitri, what makes Cypriot wine so special in comparison to other countries, our neighbor countries, uh, Greece and Turkey? Cypriot wine has its own story. It has its own grapes. Of course, international grapes grow there too. Cyprus has a strong affinity with both Greece and with Britain. So there are many British winemakers who go to, to Cyprus and they expect to taste some of the wines of the island. But you have to look at Cyprus in terms of its, its wine story in the context of itself, but also in an Hellenic context related to Greece. Do people worldwide know about the Cypriot wine? How recognized, sorry about that, how recognized is Cypriot wine? Not much. People who go to the island, most of whom are British, know the wines of Cyprus. In terms of the export of Cypriot wine, no, it's not well known. So it's my, my ambition and my joy to spread the word. And last question, what's your favorite type of wine? From Cyprus? Well, let's say worldwide. I like sweet wines a lot. So Comandaria from Cyprus makes me feel good, as do the wines of Greece, the Apassimento wines of, of Santorini, and, uh, and also Port, Madeira. But I like all wine. If it's good, I like it. Thank you very much, Dimitri. My pleasure. Μαζί μα έχουμε τον Κώστα Δάφο, είναι ο εμπορικό ακόλουθο τη Κυπριακή ΥΠΑ τη Αρμοσία στο Λονδίνο. Κύριε Κώστα, πώ πήγε το σημερινό event, Πρώτα απ' να σα ευχαριστήσω πάρα πολύ για την παρουσία σα στη σημερινή μα εκδήλωση. Πήγε πάρα πολύ καλά, είμαστε πάρα πολύ ικανοποιημένοι. Είναι η δεύτερη τέτοια εκδήλωση που διοργανώνει η Κυπριακή Παλιαρμοστία σε συνεργασία και με την υποστήριξη του Υπουργείου Ενέργεια, Εμπορίου, Βιομηχανία και Τουρισμού τη Κύπρου. Οι στόχοι μα είναι. Όπω είναι ξεκάθαρο κιόλα η, η πρόθεση του, του Κυπριακού Κρασιού. Είχαμε κάνει μια πρώτη απόπειρα στα τέλη του 2016 στον ίδιο χώρο που είχε πάρα πολύ μεγάλη επιτυχία, 14 ενοπία εκείνη την περίοδο. Σήμερα έχουμε 18 ενοπία και μάλιστα μπορώ να πω 18 από τα καλύτερα ενοπία με πάνω από 100 ετικέτε, 100 διαφορετικά κρασιά που είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό. Έχουμε τι παλιέ ποικιλίε όπω είναι το ξενιστέρι μαραθεύτικο 
και μαύρο, αλλά ε, ταυτόχρονα έχουμε και καινούργιε ε, γηγενεί ποικιλίε, όπω είναι η, η Προμάρα, το Σπούρτικο, η Μοροκανέλα. Οπότε είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό ε, να είμαστε εδώ, να είμαστε στο Λοδίνο, στο Ηνωμένο Βασίλειο, ε, για να παρουσιάσουμε τι νέε εξελίξει και τα, τα νέα κρασιά ε, των νηνοπαραγωγών μα. Και βεβαίω είναι πολύ, πάρα πολύ σημαντικό το ότι το, η συγκεκριμένη εκδήλωση λαμβάνει χώρο, ε, λα, ε, λαμβάνει τόπο στο, στο Βίντεο Σχολ, που είναι ένα ιστορικό χώρο, είναι ουσιαστικά ο οίκο του, του κρασιού, όχι μόνο στη Μεγάλη Βρετανία, αλλά και γενικότερα στον υπόλοιπο κόσμο. Και έχει και ιστορικέ διασυνδέσει με την Κύπρο από το 1363, όπου είχαμε το δείπνο των Πέντε Βασιλείων, όπου ένα από αυτού ήταν και ο Βασιλέα Πέτρο τη της Κύπρου. Σκοπεύετε να το συνεχίσετε για τα επόμενα χρόνια το συγκεκριμένο event. Αυτό είναι το, το σημαντικό, ότι ναι, σκοπεύουμε να, να συνεχίσουμε. Είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό α, να, να έχουμε επιμονή σε αυτό το, 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 το οποίο κάνουμε. Δεν α, μπορεί το, το branding, όπως λέμε, α, του κρασιού, του κυπριακού, να δημιουργηθεί από τη μια στιγμή στην άλλη, ούτε μέσα σε δύο ή τρία χρόνια. Πρέπει να υπάρχει συνέχεια στην, στην προσπάθειά μας. Α, είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό ότι η, 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 τα μηνύματα τα οποία λαμβάνουμε είναι ενθαρρυντικά και πάρα πολύ θετικά οπότε πιστεύουμε ότι τις, τα, τα επόμενα χρόνια α, είναι σημαντικό να υπάρχει σωστή τοποθέτηση του προϊόντος, δεν είναι το θέμα η εξαγωγή όσο η σωστή τοποθέτηση του προϊόντος να, να βγει προς τα έξω α, και να προωθηθεί όσον αφορά τη μοναδικότητά του α, και την ποιότητά του και μετά είμαστε πεπισμένοι ότι οι εξαγωγές θα, θα ακολουθήσουν Υπάρχει διεθνή αναγνώριση του κυπριακού κρασιού? Γίνεται σιγά σιγά. Έχουμε πάρα πολλά βήματα ακόμα να κάνουμε. Το, το αναγνωρίζουμε αυτό, γι' αυτό και έχουμε κάνει έναν μακροχρόνιο προγραμματισμό. Παρ' όλα αυτά έχουμε ξεκινήσει πάρα πολύ καλά. Θεωρούμε ότι οι δύο αυτές εκδηλώσεις στο Βίνιος Χολ είναι προς την σωστή κατεύθυνση. Έχουμε τα καλύτερα ενοπία της, τα καλύτερα κρασιά παρόντα στο, στο, στο Λονδίνο. Οπότε από εκεί και πέρα είναι η, η σκληρή και σωστή δουλειά έτσι ώστε να να μπορέσουμε να έχουμε και αύξηση των, των πωλήσεων και εκεί ακριβώς ε, όπως, όπως και όπου τη, τη, τη στέλνουμε. Διότι μην ξεχνάτε ότι υπάρχουν πάρα πολλές κατηγορίες στην αγορά. Υπάρχουν οι εισαγωγείς διανομής, υπάρχουν τα εστιατόρια, υπάρχουν οι λιανέμποροι, υπάρχουν οι εκδηλώσεις. Ε, οπότε προσπαθούμε να έχουμε μια παρουσία ε, σχεδόν παντού. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Είστε καλά, ευχαριστώ πολύ. Μαζί μας έχουμε την κυρία Αφροδίτη Κωνσταντή, η οποία είναι η νολόγος του Βασίλικων. Πείτε μας δύο λόγια για το σημερινό event. Ε, το σημερινό event καταρχήν πιστεύω ήταν αρκετά καλά οργανωμένο. Ε, υπήρχε πολύ ενδιαφέρον ε, από τον κόσμο δημοσιογράφου του κρασιού. Υπήρχε καλός κόσμος που παρουσιάστηκε στο event. Τα δύο masterclass νομίζω βοηθήσαν πάρα πολύ να γίνει μια εισαγωγή για το κυπριακό σε αυτούς που δεν το γνωρίζουν και πιστεύω ότι είμαστε αρκετά ευχαριστημένοι όλα τα ενωπία από το σημερινό event εδώ. Υπάρχει ενδιαφέρον όσον αφορά το κυπριακό κρασί στη διεθνή αγορά? Αυτό είναι ο στόχος βασικά και αυτό θέλουμε να πετύχουμε σιγά σιγά. Θέλω να, πιστεύ, να, να πιστεύουμε ότι σιγά σιγά ε, υπάρχει όλο και πιο πολύ ενδιαφέρον από τη διεθνή αγορά για το κυπριακό κρασί, να καταλάβουν τι σημαίνει κυπριακό κρασί, να γνωρίσουν σιγά σιγά τις κυπριακές ποικιλίε. Ε, και ότι το κυπριακό κρασί μπορεί να είναι ένα ποιοτικό κρασί, το οποίο δεν μπορούν επίσης να βρουν πουθενά αλλού. Θα ήθελα να σας ρωτήσω τέλος, πού μπορούμε να προμηθευτούμε τα κρασιά τα οποία παράγεται. Ε, εδώ στο Λονδίνο τα κρασιά μας τα προμηθεύει η εταιρεία Ambelli Limited. Σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ, να είστε καλά. Καλή συνέχεια, γεια σας.